understand why the law is so strange, gambling law, you have to realize that when laws are passed, they stay on the books forever, unless there's some reason to change it. And changes in society always precede changes in the laws. So as society goes through these massive waves and of changes, the law trails behind. And it, legal debris is left on the books. So we are in what I call the third wave of legal gambling. It's the third time in American history that gambling has spread everywhere. And twice before, it's come crashing down in ruin with laws that are still on the books. So if you go back to before there was a country, the colonies were funded by lotteries in England, France, and Spain. George Washington ran a lottery. It said that it was easier to buy a lottery ticket in George Washington's time than it is to, say, buy a California lottery ticket today. Because there were no banks, so if somebody wanted to sell their house, they had a drawing. Uh, there were casinos, there was horse racing, and what happened is it all came crashing down in scandal and ruin in the 1820s and 30s. Um, and what seems to be, what causes the crashes, seems to be first it's spread everywhere, it's gambling's everywhere, and you get scandals, and you get a reawakened, real conservative morality that says, oh, this is all evil, we should outlaw everything. So what happened in the, the first scandals were people were holding lotteries and uh, they never held the drawings. They just kept selling tickets. And then when they got enough money, they would abscond with the money. Uh, not George Washington, he, he had his drawing. But the, the peop there was such tremendous feeling, and it was really directed at lotteries, that they wrote into the constitutions, because that's the strongest law you can make, we will never have lotteries again. And if you look at the constitution of, say, California, or Nevada. Nevada still has a constitutional prohibition on lotteries. Um, actually, my favorite was Wisconsin's, which said, we shall never have a lottery, and the legislature shall never grant a divorce. I don't know what was going on. But they, they took that anti-lottery anti feeling with them and locked it in. So today, when people are trying, well, like Texas. Texas is, uh, wants to put in machine. First, they wanted to put in racetracks. That went to the Supreme Court is betting on a horse race a lottery, because the Constitution prohibits. Now they want to put in machines, and they're arguing, OK, uh, turning a racetrack into a racino that violates the constitutional prohibition, 150-year-old constitutional prohibition on lotteries. And nobody knows whether it does or doesn't, because the law is so old. The second wave started, you always have gambling when you have a frontier. So if you look at pictures of Gold Rush San Francisco, there's these magnificent brick buildings. Those were licensed casinos from 1850 to 1855. Um, the South was devastated by the Civil War. It needed an easy way to raise money, so they brought in uh, gambling again. It all came crashing down by the 1890s, where uh, there was a, again, well, Victorian morality started uh, trickling in but also there was widespread scandals and they wanted to, out, all the casinos got closed down um, and in fact it was the first time federal laws were passed. So if you, um, for example, today send a lottery ticket to a friend in Utah, you are actually committing a federal misdemeanor. It's a crime. In fact, it turns out the way the law is written, you can't even send a lottery ticket to someone in Nevada, because Nevada doesn't have lotteries, and we don't want the people of Nevada to hear about the evils of gambling. Um, the, the, uh, they also uh, passed uh, statutes, and usually the way laws are made is, I call it the paradigm case. Lawmakers say, ah, we've got machines that you insert a coin and pull a handle and three reels go around, so we'll outlaw that. Well, of course, the next thing they do is they figure out, you give the money to the bartender and he presses a button. And, but that doesn't fall under the law. So there were a lot of special statutes printed. By 1909, the territories of Arizona and New Mexico were told if they wanted to become states, they had to outlaw their casinos. Federal laws had outlawed all the lotteries. And um, all we had left in commercial, terms of commercial gambling 
was horse racing in New York, Maryland, and Kentucky, and in 1910, New York outlawed its racing. So we had prohibition. Then came the prohibition we all know about, the prohibition on alcoholic beverages. Um, 1931, the Depression hits. Nevada re-legalizes its casinos because they had outlawed theirs. Every year since 1931, there has been an expansion of gambling, first with racetracks, then charity bingo, then New Hampshire rediscovered the state lottery, 1964, um, and Atlantic, and uh, finally, of course, Atlantic City became the second, state, uh, second city in the second state to have um, casinos. I, I've created what I think is a fairly dramatic way to show what this third wave looks like. And it's important to understand that except for some very special areas like Indian gaming, gambling is a state issue. It's usually not a federal issue. Uh, the federal government obviously has to be involved uh, under the U.S. Congress when its tribes are involved. But even there, they said, look to the states to see what the public policy is. Because that's, gambling's a state issue. Well, if, if you look at what the public policy of the states was, this goes back to 1961. This is when the main federal statute that is used against internet gambling was passed. The states in red are the states with state lotteries. There are none. Um, so what the policy was well, of, the, of every state, basically, was against gambling. They passed a federal law that said, okay, we will help the states in their public policy of prohibition. Then, New Hampshire rediscovered the state lottery 1963, first drawing was 1964. Notice, New Hampshire thought they would make so much money because of their monopoly, they wouldn't have to institute any personal income taxes. They were wrong. But 80% of their customers came from New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. So New York was second. They didn't, they didn't have a successful lottery either. The third was, um, New Jersey, and New Jersey got it right. Instead of having drawings twice a year, they had once a week, twice a week, every day, every five minutes, instant. You didn't have to fill out a form. Price went down to a dollar each. Notice that when you get a breakthrough straight, like Florida is kind of an unusual southern state. The other southern states say, hey, look at how much money they're getting. And Florida didn't break off and float out and sink in the Atlantic. So we should do it. I stopped it in 1998 because something unusual happened. And this brings in the political question. This was a, a Republican sweep bigger even than the uh, 2010 Republican sweep. Every Republican governor was reelected. Uh, Republicans won you know, virtually everywhere. The exception. The only two Republican governors who lost were to Democrats in South Carolina and Alabama who ran on the issue of bringing in a state lottery for education. And the Republican incumbent said gambling is evil, the people said we need money, and they voted out the two incumbent Republican governors and voted in Democrats. Now, um, it's interesting to understand the how important politics is here. Most of the issues dealing with legal gambling are not decided really by parties. It's, it's usually competitors. Um, in fact, let me give you a very dramatic example. We know, but sometimes it is politics. We know then, okay, two more states are about to get state lotteries. Turns out it didn't happen. In the next year, they had a special election in Alabama to bring in a state lottery. It was a special election, not a general, so the turnout is much, late, uh, much less. In special elections, only people who feel very strongly about issues vote. There's a third of the population is strongly against gambling. They show up. They also tend to be older, white, uh, richer, more conservative, and if it's raining, then you really get a skew, uh, kind of an anti-gambling skew is what you get, but a very conservative. But what also happened here was 
churches throughout the South mobilized and brought in people to Alabama. And it was this nasty, horrible campaign about all the evils of legal gambling paid for by casinos in Mississippi. And so with that much money and the conservative vote, Alabama actually voted against bringing in state lotteries. Then, of course, the trend, now we get back to the normal trend. South Carolina, uh, it already been approved. Well, they did vote on it. Um, which brings us up to um, today. A couple things you should notice. First of all, notice Alabama still doesn't have a, um, a state lottery because um, the, they haven't been able to bring it in. And they've got a lot of other problems. Um, now they've got a new conservative governor who is even trying to close down the tribal bingo halls uh, with a very weird interpretation of the law that says, well, since uh, the bingo can only be played on paper cards in charity bingo halls, therefore the tribes can only play it that way. I've actually did a, uh, a brief to the Supreme Court saying, that's not the law. I mean, this is an easy issue. You know, we know what the law is here. Also, know which other, look, notice the other states that don't yet have lotteries. Nevada, what a surprise, right? Even Nevada had a proposal, but Nevada being Nevada, the casinos said, okay, we can have a state lottery, but the only place you could buy a state lottery ticket would be in a casino, right? Utah, uh, Mississippi still doesn't have lotteries because they've got the casinos. They don't need it. The thing about politics here is we got to be careful about oversimplifying it, but on the other hand, you can't underestimate the impact. Last year, there were elections in uh, Iowa. And last year, we know the conservatives won, the Republicans won, right? And the Republicans and conservative are basically the same. There's only, I think, two um, moderate Republicans in the U.S. Senate now. There's, there's no moderate Republicans left. They've become very extreme, very conservative. But conservatism means two different things. It means social conservatism and fiscal conservatism. Fiscal conservatism is not bad for legal gaming, although it can be a threat to things like tribes. The fiscal conservatives say, we don't want to raise taxes, we want, but, we, but the state needs money. Well, what's better than bringing in more legal gambling. The social conservatives, though, say everything is evil except the things we believe in, right? Um, social conservatives are the ones who will say, look, we should enter into the privacy of the wedding chapel, the bedroom, uh, doctor's offices, particularly women's uh, going to doctors. Hey, if they're gonna go into uh, the wedding chapel, the bedroom and doctor's offices, they certainly will go into casinos. So, and they tend to not like gambling. But Iowa's a wonderful example of what can happen when you have both fiscal conservatives and social conservatives dominating an election. They voted out three incumbent members of the state Supreme Court because those three members of the Supreme Court had ruled in favor of same-sex marriages. So that, and you'd almost never get rid of members of the Supreme Court. So this is a very conservative backlash. At the same time, under their law, every few years they have to decide, they have to vote again, county by county, on whether to reauthorize their casinos. Every single county, 17 counties, voted overwhelmingly, like 70% to 30%, to keep the casinos open. So once the gambling is legalized, they will vote to keep it in. They won't necessarily vote to bring it in. Um, you end up with situations like now New Jersey. In New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie, who is both a fiscal conservative and a social conservative, he knows they're in trouble, they got to raise money. Um, so there was a, a, a bill passed both houses to allow internet gambling intrastate in the state of New Jersey. Meanwhile, he wants to be president. We know because he keeps holding press conferences saying he's not running, right? That's the way you run in the United States. 
I mean, if he really didn't want to run, he would say, I'm not running, I won't take any more questions. Okay. Instead, he holds another press conference. So he wants to be president, but he doesn't want to be known as the governor who brought gambling into people's homes. So he vetoed the bill, but he now supports what putting it on the ballot. If the voters decide it's not his fault that they brought it in. Okay. Having uh, knocked the Republicans, I also have to knock the Democrats. Um, for the most part, I thought the Democrats were fairly, you know, reasonable. Uh, but last, it was a week ago Monday, I testified in Sacramento on behalf of uh, the Rincon um, tribe in California to do what I thought everybody would understand is just something that should be done, which is to allow tribal casinos and licensed card clubs to be able to enforce their gambling debts in state court. So I testified as an expert witness in front of the State uh, Assembly Judiciary Committee. I said, this is the only legal business that can't enforce its contracts. It's written contracts. These are written markers. And the tribes are not only federally recognized, they're co-regulated by the state, pursuant to compacts that have been passed by the state legislature. I knew we were going to get some problems with the Republicans. A couple Republicans, one in particular, immediately says, okay, you can use the state, the tribes should be allowed to use the state courts, they just have to waive all their sovereign immunity. You know, I mean, that's kind of the Republican view. And we knew that was going to happen, and we, you know, we were prepared for that. What I wasn't prepared for was the Democrats who said, wait a minute, you're saying enforce gambling debts. I said, yeah, it's legal, licensed, you know, revenue is shared but we have to protect adults from themselves. We have to protect people. These are kind of the same people who want to outlaw McDonald's hamburgers. And so on a committee of 12 people, there were 12, we got three votes. I mean, it was, it was like astounding. And, I, and so we're gonna go in the Senate and we're gonna go that route instead. What has happened is besides the normal competition, which is something you always have to watch anytime you wanna do anything, your competitors are going to lobby against it. The other thing you have to watch for is the parties have both become real extreme. And it's mainly because of, on top of everything else, it's because it's structural. It's because of the primaries. Primaries are like special election. The only people who show up are those who really care about the issue. So Republican primaries tend to be who is the most conservative? Who's, now it's the Tea Party. Who is the craziest, you know? Who believes that we should, uh, oh, I, Ron Paul just said we should legalize prostitution and heroin. Um, he said that in the presidential debate a couple weeks ago, which isn't necessarily a bad idea, but he's not gonna get elected. That's a little too extreme. So what has happened is the, the Republican Party has become more and more conservative. Um, and in fact, every time Obama makes a concession, they say, great, now we're gonna be, we want something even more conservative. The Democrat primary, though, is going more and more the other way. The only people who show up are extreme liberals. And so you end up with, and there are extreme liberals who don't believe that people should be gambling. They should spend, the, particularly poor people, should spend their money on uh, job training. So Ralph Nader has absolutely come out against gambling. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, Kennedy Townsend ran for governor of Maryland against putting in uh, Racinos. Uh, they're still much smaller than the right. Um, but you end up with things like the California Judiciary Committee saying we're not going to let tribes enforce their legal written contracts in, um, in state courts. Now, to the, but the, the main impact still is competition. This gives you a pretty dramatic view of why Nevada, there's Reno, there's Las Vegas, why Nevada cares so much about Indian gaming. They used to get 40% of their customers from California and Arizona. That has gone down. And one of the reasons it's gone down is uh, I was a visiting professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I created this map. It is, as best I could do at the time, every piece of federally recognized Indian land in California, meaning every place that you could have tribal gaming. And there tend to be none in uh, the major 
counties, LA and Orange County, but that's San Diego County in the Bay Area. We know there's so much. And notice, of course, they cut off traffic to Reno, which is in deep trouble. They cut off traffic to some extent to Las Vegas. So competition is what, what breeds changes. Every time the tribes want to do something, they can't do it. And the, the real answer to success in gaming, it's marketing, but more important, it's simply population. These are, this is what the United States looks like today. California has 37 million people, which means it is larger than the entire country of Canada. If you can do intrastate internet poker, for example, uh, they're doing it on a province by province basis in Canada, but you've got a po population that likes to play poker on top of it um, with this wonderful built-in base. This is the reason Nevada is so concerned, is that Nevada is so small, the California isn't growing much anymore, but I just checked, the growth in California was greater uh, in the last 10 years than 3 million. It actually grew more than the entire state of Nevada, but it's considered to be slow now, that it's going down. And people equals money. The Las Vegas Strip, which of course has made itself a destination, uh, reinvented itself as, a, as one of the you know, wonders of the world, worth passing the, uh, crossing a continent, it's finally digging out of the recession, makes almost $6 billion a year. Atlantic City is dying every year. I mean, they celebrate when they don't go down 10% month to month. Um, they're in real trouble. They're getting surrounded now by competition. The um, interesting to show you what a monopoly. The two casinos, there's only two casinos in Connecticut, and they make uh, obviously uh, almost as much as um, all the casinos in um, Chicago. That's the biggest racino, and again, population, Yonkers, so you've got the whole New York Northeast area. All of the Nevada casinos are about $10 billion. The best estimate I could make is the California tribes alone are about $7 billion, and all tribal gaming is about $26 billion. Um, now, it's not quite fair to say, hey, California is almost as big as uh, Las Vegas or, or Nevada, because again, California has 10 times the population, 12 times the population of um, Nevada. But the big event that happened was internet gambling, right? The uh, Black Friday. So the big question is, who cares? My favorite cartoon on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Who are these people? I mean, who are the people who are running the internet gambling sites? Well, I think that the, the Black Friday, the uh, arrests of the biggest, the five, they closed down the five largest poker sites that were taking money from the United States, I think that helps the tribes, the local casinos, the local card clubs say, we need to have it here. We need to know who the operators are, have their computers here, have the payment process here. We can regulate it. And we can tax it. Here's the history of how we got here. The Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, for, for those of you, I, I mean, many of you know the history, but let's go into a little bit of the details because it's so bizarre. This was not what the Department of Justice wanted. It wasn't what really what anybody wanted, except a guy named Bill Frist, who was the re majority leader of the US Senate. He was, wanted to run for president. Uh, Jim Leach, who's a powerful congressman from Iowa, said, hey, it's 2006, we're going to lose, Bush is very unpopular, Republicans are unpopular, we're going to lose at least one of the houses, maybe both, get that bill through. So he attached this to the Safe Port Act, capital S, capital A, capital F, capital E, I don't, it stands for Secure All Facility, I don't know what it stands for. Um, and it was a must pass. He wouldn't show it to anybody, like he wouldn't let the Democrats read it and said, you don't like it, vote in favor of terrorism. We know, so it passed, you know, two o'clock in the morning, right before they recessed for the election. We know this was done as a rush. One of the reasons is it doesn't have a pronounceable name. 
it's not safe port, it's Ouija or Ouija or, uh, you know, I just call it Prohibition 2.0 because it'll be about as successful in outlawing internet gambling as Prohibition 1.0 was successful in outlawing drinking, right? People think it's out it outlawed gambling. It did not. It did only two things. Um, it created a new crime that if you are already breaking the law with internet gambling, now there's one more felony. And it called for the de Treasury Department, the governors of the Federal Reserve Board, in consultation with the Department of Justice. So the DOJ knew about this. They had to issue regulations. And the regulations were to identify and block all money for illegal internet gambling. Turns out it's impossible. Nobody even knows what illegal internet gambling is. You can't define it. Um, but secondly, banks don't look at transactions. They don't read your checks. They don't, they don't care. And, and if you get a MasterCard bill and it says Hard Rock Casino, they still they don't know if that's legal or illegal. They don't even, they, they're not looking at that. The big news is, well, again, stepping a step back for a second. We've got this statute now that does really nothing except scared a lot of people. It scared all the publicly traded companies like Party Poker out of the US. What we've also got is a war of intimidation being run by the Department of Justice. They don't have good laws. They don't have the two things you absolutely need for a successful prosecution. You need a good statute, and the Wire Act isn't the greatest statute for them, and you need a person who is physically present in the US. We don't allow trials in absentia. They must be brought here, and extradition treaties don't cover gambling. So instead, they scare people. They go after Net, the founders of NetTeller and PayPal, you know, right before the Super Bowl. Uh, they seized money in bank accounts. Well, the latest thing they did was they arrested the, uh, well, they arrested a few, but they charged the principals of poker stars, um, absolute poker, full tilt, with all sorts of horrible crimes, money laundering and everything else. Sca seized the, the accounts, froze the money, although they say they didn't freeze it, but they did. Um, scared everybody. The good news, there's actually some good news. First of all, it doesn't mean that internet gambling is illegal. I mean, it's very complicated. You need to get somebody like me. I do a lot of consulting and act as an expert witness, and I'm doing actually a lot of internet besides Indian gaming and land-based you know, gambling. You, you need to look at each operation, what are they doing? Here, this is unbelievably, frankly, they were stupid. Um, to give you an example, the worst charge is they went to the part owner and officer of a bank and said, we know you don't want to handle these transactions anymore. How about we give you $10 million, you give us 30% of the bank. And he said, fine. Oh, and by the way, the bank is located in Utah. I mean, of all the states you would use, that's the last state you would choose to run illegal gambling out of Utah. But how small was this guy? He asked for a bonus, a personal bonus of $20,000, right? I figured. If this was Goldman Sachs, they'd be 20 million. So 20, 000, for $20,000, he's now going to spend, oh, five years in prison, you know? Um, so they've got what looks, in, in effect, is a bribery, so real money laundering. The other money laundering and all the other claims are, are really not as good. They said they were, uh, they tricked the banks. They were selling, said they were selling dog food, and it was really internet poker. Well, first of all, how dumb are the banks when you see a billion dollars worth of dog food? You know, um, I don't believe that. The second thing is the fraud consisted in tricking the banks into making millions of dollars. They just didn't want to do it. But they had no criminal fines, no civil fines. The other thing they did that was really stupid, and this, again, you don't understand the arrogance. Why did they do this? Last year, in April of last year, exactly a year before Black Friday, um, the federal government indicted this guy named uh, David Zetkoff. He apparently had been turned in by these websites that the poker operators, he was like a payment processor 
The allegation is he stole, embezzled like a hundred million dollars. They turned him into the feds. If you turn somebody into the federal government, you can expect a couple things. He's going to try to strike a deal, and he's going to try to seek revenge. They kept their operations going the same way they were doing their payment processing. At, so this guy knew everything. He had all the inside information. The indictment is actually a, called a superseding indictment. The indictment on Black Friday is his indictment. It was filed a year ago in April, and it was the United States versus Vetkov. His name doesn't appear anymore. He cut a deal and turned them all in. So the good news is, although everybody's scared and thinks it's horrible, the, the real truth is, if you're exceptionally stupid, you can get in trouble. Um, if, you keep, if you do things right and legally, you don't get in trouble. The other problem is the cases are, are really weak. You can't just say, hey, you lied to the banks and you were doing internet poker and you called it dog food. If internet poker is not illegal, who cares? So they had to find a law somewhere. And what they found was a misdemeanor New York statute that if five or more people do $2,000 in business a day, it then becomes a federal crime, the Organized Crime Control Act. And so they took a misdemeanor New York statute to charge federal felonies against foreign operators and seize bank accounts in Panama. There's some problems with that. The Department of Justice can't bring a case. They can file charges. They can't bring a, have a trial unless they get the defendants. And there are no extradition treaties, except the only one I found is the US and Hong Kong uh, for extraditing gambling. Now you can call it organized crime, but that doesn't work. They go to the local place like Antigua and they say, hey, um, this is really just gambling. And they don't get extradited to the United States. Um, I mentioned the fraud was tricking people into making millions of dollars. The other problem was that the Department of Justice actually seized money from, uh, I mean, seized the dot-com names of the world, including places where it was 100% legal. They have this terrible public relations fiasco uh, building. And so they're going to have to show why they can seize prevent somebody in England from doing something that's 100% legal in England. For people in this room, there are actually wonderful opportunities. What has happened is the competitors are gone. This is like selling cars and finding Ford, General Motors, Toyota, and Honda have left the market for the United States. First party poker was driven out because they're a publicly traded company, and when the UIGEA was passed, they left. Now, the five biggest sites have all been closed down. This is, this is what you need for the level playing field, because those sites have millions of names, and they have wonderful of, of players. They have PR, they've got name identification, they're gone. Secondly, getting back to the political issue, the Republicans were rewarded by being the, the party of no. Nothing is going to happen in Congress. They don't even vote for funding for troops for Afghanistan. They're certainly not going to vote to, to legalize internet poker. So nothing is going to happen on the federal level. In fact, nothing will happen unless the Democrats win in two, uh, 2012, Obama's reelected, Democrats take over the House. Then. The bill would be introduced in 2013, it would pass in 2014, there would be regulations. So 2015 is the earliest that anything can happen on the federal level with internet gambling, which means it's all, all the action is in the states. And um, there's a lot of states that are absolutely desperate for money. And they will, bring, they will let tribes have internet poker, they'll let anybody who's licensed have internet poker if they'll give them a share and give them cash up front. That also means, and this is, I'm doing a lot of these, they, they're called reasoned legal opinions under the UIGEA that says, hey, this is legal gambling. So I'm doing ones for free or free alternative means of entry, poker sites. Um, there is legal, there's this group, the Atlantis Internet Group, that is setting up linking tribe, tribal, uh, any gaming on any tribe can be linked with any other and it's actually a closed loop so it's not even the internet and you can do poker. Um, 
you could establish your name identification, you can get the customer list. Uh, remember, the main competitors are gone. So now's the time, even before the state does anything, you can get set up so that when the state reaches its compact with the tribes, for example, um, you, can, you can open and operate.